And this is the really interesting thing about the Olympics generally and the IOC. Uh, you know, you mentioned there about um, liberal democracies and, and their motives are very different and the way they measure success is very different to yeah. other nations but and other political systems. And people will argue that only liberal democracies deserve to host the Games. Um, and yet the Olympics was built to try and break down some of those barriers to make sure that we go to other people's places and learn a little about them. So with all of this, and you look at the, the landscape and what the future holds, and nobody knows the answer to that, you mentioned the Middle East, you know, and the potential that obviously they would like to host an Olympic Games and the way they would measure their legacy, again, is different to the way Brisbane is going to measure its legacy or Paris or LA. So mm -hmm. how can the IOC get it right? Because it seems whichever way they turn, there is going to be negativity and criticism. And yet how do they hold true to, to those values and the reasons why it was established in the beginning to make sure that there is a success story at the end and whether that's measuring, uh, you know, that you didn't go into a financial black hole or whether it's that uh, your city is now or nation is now engaged in the world generally. I mean, how does the IOC get it right? Because it seems to me that every way they turn, whichever way they turn, there's criticism. Do you just ignore the criticism? Yes, <laughs> you do. Uh, I, I, I taught a class last night to a bunch of grad, undergraduate and graduate business students here in Nashville. And uh, this question actually came up and I put up uh, fundamental principles of Olympism from the charter. And uh, I said, it, it's a very egocentric, almost arrogant point of view. And I didn't want to say ignorant, but it is. The IOC is a neutral organization, as Thomas likes to say, they can't be apolitical. I'm not sure I understand the, what the difference and the distinction is between the two words, but I understand what he's trying to say. If, if we only wanted to give the Olympic Games to people who looked like you and me and lived in liberal uh, democracies based on capitalism like you and me, then that, that, would, be that would contravene the Olympic Charter. Um, and they've done it many times. They've been brave. Uh, think about giving the games to Tokyo in 1964, 19 years at the end of World War II. There was friction. Uh, Sarajevo, I mean, think about it going to Moscow at the height of the Cold War. There was friction. And they stood their ground. They said, we're fulfilling our mission and our purpose, which is to play sport at the benefit of mankind everywhere. There's no asterisk on that there's no but there's no however i mean it's that stark um and i think that more often than not they've got it right and i think i think there are a lot of very smart people in Lausanne. uh in my personal opinion is they know that there are three areas on the planet where i think and i'm not wrong uh, the youth are the most underserved from an olympic perspective Africa, and you, well, we're going to have youth games. I get it. The Middle East and the subcontinent of India. Um, and they know that the games must go there to fulfill their destiny, to fulfill their purpose. How do you go about doing that? How do you mitigate risk? How do you help them prepare for it? Um, I think that's part of the new bid process that they get criticized for. I think the new bid process is designed to do just that, to say, you know, in a couple of cycles, we really ought to be in name the place, the Middle East or the Indian subcontinent or Africa. And we need to find some partners there and prepare them. So when the time comes to actually properly bid, they'll be ready and it won't be um a mess for them to 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 get ready and it, it it will be for the right reasons both economically and societally so i think that they're very focused on that but they also understand coming off the last decade 
that they just got to get out of the risk business. And I keep saying that. And I do think that the new process does mitigate that somewhat for them. And I applaud them for it. You've um, written a piece recently, <clears throat> again on LinkedIn, where you talk about uh, the marketing of the games and um, sponsors and that storytelling aspect. And mm -hmm. this idea that some people are trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Can you expand on that? And and I think about this as well. Is, is the Olympics different uh, to every other sporting event? And I've got my own ideas, but when I listen to criticisms that come about, mostly in the media, uh, I often think about this, you know, would the world be a better place without the Olympic Games? And we're seeing that kind of a challenge now with this idea that, um, you know, they're going to stage something called the Enhanced Games. Uh, and they're trying to sort of tear at the fabric that they say is like a shroud and the Olympics should disappear in that direction. So talk about your views on what you think the Olympic Games means and, and does it have a future in a world that is changing? We're in the third millennium of the Olympic Games, so good luck to the enhanced games. <laughs> um, I don't think there'll be much appetite for anything like that except on the fringes of whatever the fringe is, and nobody's interested in the fringe. Um, back to your sponsorship question. Um, that's how I began my Olympic career as a sponsor with Delta Airlines in the, in the Atlanta Games. So that's where my heart and soul and I feel expertise is bidding was fun and it was a glitzy bright thing to do sponsorships a lot harder and it is a completely different value proposition for commercial brands the Olympic proposition is from a traditional sports league whether it's AFL whether it's NFL whether it's Champions League whether it's NBA Formula One they all have obviously seasons with x number of matches or games in them they have recognizable athletes they're in the market six seven eight nine months out of the year when brands invest in that as a sports marketer it's pretty transferable the skill set if you work on the nfl you can work on an nba if you work on nba you can work on afl you can work on fifa it, well, not FIFA, but maybe Champions League, those types of Bundesliga, whatever. Let's not forget, we're talking about something that is 17 days every four years. And it's kids you've never heard of. And they may be a bright, shining sp star for 10 out of those 17 days. And then you never hear from them again. And these are kids that have spent, if they're 19, they've spent at least 10 years of their life perfecting for three minutes of time in the Olympic Games. And there is no next season. There is no tomorrow. It's it's, it's just do or die for them. And they're not going to make any money out of that when it's done. So the whole value proposition is, is, is quite different. And I tell everybody that, I'm, that I work for as a sponsor, you, you kind of are, it sounds corny, but you, you bought a sponsorship for, for humanity because the Olympic Games... And, and athletes hate for me to say this, the Olympic Games are not about sport. You didn't buy a sport sponsorship. The Olympic Games are beautiful because sport is this vehicle that we get in and takes us to this destination, that it is universal human values. And I've, we proved this empirically doing research for the IOC when I was there, and they keep doing that research, I guess. But I can sit you down and... I've briefed hundreds of, it feels like, creative agencies over the years on what are these values, what do they mean, and how do consumers react to them? And it's quite different from a commercial sports business enterprise. So that's what I was trying to get to with this round peg and a square hole, and I use round as a terrible metaphor for the rings. Um, but I see it time and time again, and brands realize it costs a lot of money to be an olympic sponsor you have a finite period of time to get an roi especially if you're an ocog sponsor just for say brisbane or la or paris you don't have world rights you have limited rights only in the host country so you 
you kind of go back to, well, how do they do it and pick the sport league, whatever it is in, in the host country. And that's not the model to follow. It just isn't the model to follow. And there's also a real lack of awareness on the difference between a financial transaction, i.e. we got a return on our investment by selling more stuff, or a brand transaction, i.e. people feel better about our brand. They love us more. They're trying this trial, it's loyalty, it's esteem. Those are powerful. Unfortunately, they're very hard to measure on a balance sheet or an income statement, but they are. That's where the real true value of this is. And I think that sponsors, if if you wait until a month before the games or two months before the games and try to do something during the games with your quote athlete ambassadors or whatever it is, you've wasted years of opportunity to get a return on that investment. And that investment is an investment in humanity and in universal values and people love it and they get it. And all the consumers tell us is we will support anybody who's a sponsor of the games if they tell us why they're a sponsor of the games, why they love the games as much as we love the games, and tell us about the values that matter to us. Because here are the values. The IOC has a set of values. We, we didn't create it, but we documented it 20 years ago, and they're still using those values. And they're deep. It's not about winning. It's not about medals. It's not even the competition stuff. It's human values like hope like dreams, aspiration, friendship, those things are what people, I think, get from the Olympics. And we, the research we did also showed us that a lot of people, a great percentage of people watch the Olympic Games who don't like sports, don't follow sports, but they'll stop what they're doing to watch the Olympics for 17 days. Why? Because it's about us. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the best representation of us in these kids. And you know what? If we can only do that for 17 days every four years, that's better than nothing. And it's the last thing on the planet, the last thing that we all want to participate in. Whether you're from North Korea, whatever Russia says, yes, they want to be there. America wants to be there. Brazil wants to be there. Go down the list. 206 countries. They want to be there for some reason. And it's, there's, there's nothing else, nothing else like it. Nothing else like that. 